Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Please help me welcome our speaker tonight. It is Scott, and it's from the Underground Group in Philly. So welcome, Scott. My name is Scott, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm grateful to be alive and sober and here tonight to share my experience, strength, and hope with all of you. And I'm going to do my best to do that. Um, I'm here by default, so I guess in a way I'm grateful that uh, my friend Lenny has the flu. (laughs) I am a real alcoholic. I'm also grateful for a lot of other things, like being a recovered alcoholic. And being a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous What that means is that I have a response to alcoholism. I'm not cured, but I have a response. And on most days, that response is immediate. You know, in my 10th step, it tells me that I watch out for resentment and selfishness and dishonesty and fear. And what that means is I watch for it. Like if I have to meet you at 12 o'clock on the corner of 20th and Locust, around two minutes to 12, I'm watching for you. You know, I used to confuse that with my nightly review, and they're two different deals, and I'll get into that later. But uh, what this has been about for me is gaining access to power, gaining access to real power, not like electrical power or nuclear power, but real power, the power of God. And having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I've seen many of our members go back to sleep, the reemergence of ego that it talks about in our book. And uh, I'm I'm not interested in that. I I don't want that for myself, and I don't want it for anybody else. But but sometimes I have to let people be where they are. I bounced in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for 18 years. From the age of 17 to 35, I come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and right away I start to do everything that my thinking mind told me to do. What my ego told me to do. All the lies I was attached to about what was going to make me well. You know, I was under the delusion that alcohol was my dilemma. And now that I put down the booze, I know what I need to do now. And I'd walk into the meetings and I'm going to do a 90 and 90 and I'm going to just not drink and go to meetings and I'll play the tape through to the end. And if I could do any of those things successfully, I believe me, I would not be here tonight. I just wouldn't. That's the truth. So when I would get sober, I would go right back to work. I'd get the job. Back then, it was a new pair of sneakers. You know, everybody knew in the room had a brand new pair of Chucks or a pair of Nikes or whatever it was. That was the deal. You go out and get a new pair of sneakers, and you got to get a new, you know, a new jacket if it was, you know, a nice gangster leather jacket in the wintertime. And then you get a new relationship and maybe a new car or a new truck, and you pretty up your living situation. And I did that. I bounced in and out for 18 years, and uh, none of those things ever worked. And I walked into these rooms, and I would hear people say things like, there's a hole in my soul. I'm empty. And I would buy into that because I can form an opinion in a snap. It doesn't have to be truth. I can hear somebody say something, or just in my own thinking mind, I can form an opinion. But what I found is that my experiences have changed my opinions. I'm not interested in in opinion without experience today because I know what that looks like in my everyday life. And that hole in the soul that I heard people talk about and that I thought I was experiencing was there was nothing farther from the truth. What I experienced when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and I put down a drink was that I was consumed and full of self. I was so full of things that no longer worked, like money, possessions, people, relationships. I was full of that stuff. Pride, contempt, prejudice, worship of other things, whatever it may be. Chapter to the Agnostics speaks about that to me. Things that don't work. And it made me feel empty because I was full of self. There was no hole in my soul, God shaped or any other shape. The deep down fact for me is that God is within me. God is within everybody in this room, the man or woman out in the street, 
drunk right now has the Spirit of God within them as much as any of us here. The difference is in the awakening of the Spirit. I knew nothing about that. As a matter of fact, my ego had me suffering in silence many times as a newcomer and as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, four years without a drink. And I say suffering in silence because my ego demands I not tell anybody in this room or, God forbid, my wife or for the ladies, your husband. Our egos demand that we not tell anybody just what's going on in our minds. Because if you knew, what would you think of me then? Somebody would ask me how I'm doing when I walked in the meeting. I'd tell them, great. I wasn't going to tell them about the fist fight I had three hours ago in the middle of Spring Garden Street in the center lane blocking traffic during rush hour. I wouldn't tell you that because I'm two and a half years sober at this point, And how's that going to look? So I suffered in silence because that's what my ego, this false sense of self, told me that I needed to do. And there was a grace period that I had. I wasn't thinking about a drink. I bounced back in here in 2004. God willing for the last time. And God laid a great deal of grace onto me. I went right back to work. I prettied up my living situation. My relationship was a disaster. So I rolled out of that and I moved downtown with my brother who was also sober. So I got the job. I got rid of that bad relationship. Now I'm looking for a new one. And I would bounce from relationship to relationship. And maybe her big toe was shaped a little funny and I can't, go, I can't stay in this relationship. It was always something. As soon as I got into a relationship, I'm looking for something. You know, because if you're not right for me, I can't be with you. Maybe I'm not right for you. I never considered that. That until I experienced the death, the death of self, I'm not going to be right for any relationship or any job or anything across the board. So I took it a step further. I met a woman in AA. And then we decided to get married. And uh, after about 10 months, we're separated, right? Because she wasn't following the script. You know, she wasn't acting and doing and saying what I wanted. I never handed her a copy of that script, mind you. But if you loved me, you would do it. You would just know. I had no idea about relationships, you know? Growing up as a kid, my ideas of a real man were the guys out on the corner drinking, you know. The neighborhood was full of tough guys, you know. Everybody thought they were a gangster and this and that. I, and cowboy movies. I grew up watching cowboy movies. Outlaw Josie Wales was my favorite cowboy movie, you know. I grew up thinking I was the outlaw Josie Wales. You know, you're going to pull them pistols or whistle Dixie. So that's how I went through life. I don't know what it's like being married to the outlaw Josie Wales, but I can tell you now I have an ex-wife. You know, that that's how I bounced in and out of life. Character defect is how I do business. So I meet you. You don't meet me. You meet character defect, whatever that character is going to be for the day. Then while I'm in the relationship with you, I'm dealing with you by way of character defect. You're not going to get to see me. For one, my ego's got me so twisted up, I really don't know who I am. And then when the relationship isn't working out, I make my exit by way of character defect. Stone cold. Because growing up, that's what my ego told me I needed to be. Stone cold. And during one of these breakups, we separated three times before we got divorced. She looked up the definition of a sociopath online. And I fit. <laughs> We're laughing now, but I'll tell you what. She didn't think it was so funny. She realized that she was married to a sociopath and it all made sense. I'm very grateful to a loving God that's restored me to sanity today that I suffered from untreated alcoholism and that I'm not a sociopath because I don't know of any treatment for the sociopath. But the only effective treatment known that I'm aware of is in our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I wanted no part of walking, excuse me, walking through these doors. Any one of the dozen times that I did it, I came in here because I ran out of gas and I needed a little bit of relief. I didn't know what freedom meant. And that's what this program and that's what God offers me is freedom. Freedom from the lies that my thinking mind's been telling me all my life. My sponsor told me a little deal when I started working with him. And it goes like this. In the beginning, in my beginning, not the beginning, but in my beginning, God created Scott. And then Scott created Scott. And what the work we're going to do will take me back to the Scott that God created. I didn't know what to think of that, but 
I was asking this man to save my life, so I went along with that. What I found out is that, you know, it talks about entering the world of the spirit, being restored to sanity later on down the shade in my step work. I didn't know what that meant and what I was going to have to do and the truth I was going to have to wake up to in order to get there. But the price of admission was a real doozy. I'm not talking about the drinking and the other stuff, the alcohol. I'm talking about letting go of my old beliefs. Beliefs I may currently be walking with today, currently, today. You know, current agnosticism. If I'm not continuing to grow in understanding and effectiveness, if I'm not improving my conscious contact with God, I'm going back to sleep. Waking up to new truth, because what I thought was true was true until I found out it no longer was, over and over and over again in my life. Growing in understanding and effectiveness for me is understanding of alcoholism and just how deep it goes and effectiveness at getting to the truth about these many layers of my illness and the ego, smashing my ego. Like if my ego was a construction project, alcoholism was the general contractor. And I have to dismantle my ego right down to the foundation. Then i got to rip out the foundation because it's underground. It's hidden. It's a lie. Just like the tree of illness that I walk with. Where are the roots on a tree? They're underground. They're hidden. And I put down the drink and alcoholism goes underground and it resurfaces in other areas of my life. And I come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and instead of listening to someone who might awaken my spirit, I'm looking at her. And then I'm looking maybe over at her. And I'm already picturing white picket fences. And I'm looking over there and maybe she's my salvation. I don't see it as salvation, but that's the truth. Worship of other things. People. Anything. Anything to get me out of where I currently am. Maybe I'll get involved in some drama. Plenty of that in any kind of room. I mean, you know, I can get involved in drama. And if I don't have any, I'll get involved in yours. (laughs) And maybe I'll gossip some. Because while I'm gossiping, my ego's proving its point. That's why we complain. This great thing called the ego, the false sense of self that I walk with. I can prove my point by gossiping about you. I can prove my point by complaining about a middle-of-the-road meeting I was just at, or whatever it may be. Love and tolerance was not my code when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I went through the book of my sponsor, I started to have an experience with that book. And I was told to be a seeker of experience. Because the knowledge in that book is not going to keep me sober. The knowledge my sponsor can convey to me is not going to keep me sober. I can go to 180 meetings in 90 days and not stay sober. I've done it. Alcoholism took me down some very dark alleys. Out there getting loaded and in here. When I was out there getting loaded, alcoholism took me to being an armed robber. You know, being in the grip of the grapes... It seemed like a good career choice to me, you know. That's, that's where it took me in the end. And I had to go back and make amends to every person that I, that I ever committed an armed robbery on. Because it says in my step book that, uh, you know, hurting them or others, I'm not included in that. You know, so I got to go back and not just me get free of that, but allow them to get free of me. And I'll touch on that later. In 2004, like I said, I was separated from alcohol for what I hope is the last time. And the previous time was in 1997. And I swore it was my last time. I was done, you know. And my brother and I, right away, we hooked up with a luxury apartment in a neighborhood called Roxborough, northwest Philadelphia. And it had two balconies overlooking the pool and the gym and the tennis courts, all that great stuff, right? Because when I got sober, I need some stuff now i got to get my life back on track. And I started going to a lot of meetings. But getting a sponsor and getting well and recovering from alcoholism was not something I was interested in because I, you couldn't have told me I was sick. You know, I, I was living under the delusion that alcohol was my dilemma. So after about two years of not drinking, actually what I did is I went on a two-year sex spree. I had a girl in New York who I thought I loved, and every other night of the week there was somebody else. Because untreated alcoholism was on me 24-7. And I couldn't pour booze on top of it, so I poured sex on top of it. And I was into some other illegal stuff on the side, too. You know, I was going to be a sober bookie. 
and uh, that wasn't working out for me. You know, preying on other people's addiction to gambling. You know that that and plus the whole ego trip. You know, outlaw Josie Wales, right? So uh, I show up at a beef and beer, like a, a barbecue thing, and uh, I had no thought of drinking, absolutely none. And I get a nice, beautiful burger. You know, you ever watch Scooby Doo? Shaggy makes those great burgers. I had made one of those, and uh, I look over at the keg, and a buddy of mine's pouring a nice cold beer, and I says, "Man, that would go great with this burger." And I grabbed it, and I put that beer to my lips, and everybody at the Everybody in the backyard was looking at me like, what are you doing? They knew I was sober. They knew what sort of an animal I was when I got loaded. But I, I even had that thought myself that maybe this isn't such a bright move. But I quickly replaced that with, well, if it gets that bad, I'll go back to AA. Strange mental blank spot. I knew nothing about the strange mental blank spot that me as a real alcoholic can and will experience without developing a relationship with God. That was the key that was missing for me. And because I said I believe in God, you know, that was going to be enough. And not only does my book tell me, but my experience tells me that belief in God is not enough. I need to have an experience with God. And the way that I have an experience with God is by having an experience with the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and to continue to be a seeker of experience. And I'll tell you, if... Going back to AA didn't happen for another five years. Within two years, my brother and I, who's not a violent guy, I turned him on to, uh, to robbing street corners. And we ran around North Philadelphia robbing street corners. And we would take whatever they were doing and we'd take their money. And that's what we did until a friend of ours was shot in the face and killed doing it. And uh, maybe now it's time to get sober, you know. And my brother and I, uh, we lived in this luxury apartment, and there was no heat, and there was no electric. And we would steal food from the supermarket. And we had this little joke. You know, you buy a jar of jelly, and it says, refrigerate after opening. And he would point to me and say, place on balcony after opening, and laugh. Because that was our refrigerator, the balcony, that overlooked the pool and the gym and the tennis courts and all that great stuff that was going to make my life manageable. It meant nothing. My relationships meant nothing. If you tell a person with sane, rational thinking, pick up a drink, that one ice-cold beer along with your burger, everything that you care about is at stake. I have a 20-year-old son now, and I hadn't had a relationship with him for 10 years because I would say I'm going to pick him up tomorrow, and I'd stop at the bar for a drink on Friday with no intention of blowing my son off the next day. Sunday would come, I'd call up, I can't make it. You're already a day late. Now, you tell somebody with sane, rational thinking that all of that's at stake, your family, your savings, your possessions, your entire life as you know it is at stake. If you pick up that drink, they're not going to drink. The baffling feature of alcoholism is that no matter what's at stake, I will pick up that drink. My first step experience is not that no matter what, I can't drink. It's no matter what, I will drink. And if I don't believe it, let's look at the record. So I'm looking at all these great things that I thought were going to make my life manageable from a dark, very cold apartment in February. Until the sheriff came and bounced us out of there. And I spent the next two days getting loaded in a hotel room. And then I made a phone call to a woman I know would help me. She was always trying to save me. Come by the apartment. When are you going to stop? How bad's it got to get? And I'd say, I don't know how bad it's got to get, but I got a bottle of booze and some other stuff in the apartment. I got to go. I'll see you later. So I knew she'd help me, and I called her, and I wasn't going to see the truth. My illness would not let me see the truth about the deal is that I was in a jam, and that's why I called her. She wanted a relationship with me. She cared about me. I was in a jackpot, and I needed a way out. So I called her up, and, of course, she came and got me. Instant move-in, live-in situation. And then I proceeded to drag her into my jam. I couldn't stop. You know? And she knew nothing about this deal. She'd actually go buy me a 30-pack of beer while I'm out there planting tomatoes in the garden. Thinking if she was there, she could watch me. You know? I'm going out for a pack of cigarettes, and I'd leave for a week. 
Or I'm going out to get a cheesesteak and I'd have a baseball bat under my jacket because I knew when I ran out of the money in my pocket, I was going to hop the counter and rob somebody. That's my life loaded. And after a while, she figured if I can't beat him, join him. She joined the team. And I made a criminal out of her. And a couple of her girlfriends were great boosters. And that's what we would do. You know, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do anything else but rob in the end. I just couldn't. I could. I mean, I'm, I have God-given talents. I'm an ornamental plasterer. I do cast ornament and restore historical structures. I've been doing it for 25 years. But nobody wanted to see me coming. None of the contractors I was involved with, I mean, there was a, a dozen contractors that would tell me, when you, if you get laid off from your union gig, show up and take my truck and a crew full of guys and go out and do some work. I, I couldn't go anywhere. So what did my thinking mind, this brilliant mind I have, well, I can go rob. So that's what we did. And this went on for four years until one day I was sitting uh, alone and I was drinking. And uh, she had taken something to the fence, you know, the guy you take your stolen merchandise to. The house was full of it, you know. We would just sell it as we needed it. And she took something to this guy to sell and go get something else and some booze. And I'm sitting there drunk, and I'm looking around the room. And it's a disaster. There was trash all over the place. I hadn't shaved in a long time or bathed. And uh, I just looked up at the ceiling. I said, God, I can't believe that this is my life. I can't believe, God, this is my life. But it was. That was the truth. And I said, God, if you're out there, please save me. I can't stop. I couldn't stop what I was doing. And I knew there was something a little better out there because I'd had a taste of what being alcohol-free was like. I had no idea what this deal was like my life currently, but I knew there was something better than what I was living. So I asked God, please save me if you're out there. And then a minute later, she came in the door with whatever she went to go get. And I forgot about God, and I was off to the races that fast. One minute I was talking to God, the next minute I was doing just what I was doing. Two days later, rap at the door. But it wasn't the police rap, you know, like when it sounds like the door's going to cave in. Um, it was just a rap on the door. So I pull up the shade, and I look down on the street, and there's about 12 guys down there in paramilitary gear and all that. And I said, oh, man, you know, there was no getting away. I ran to the back window, and it was about 6 in the morning. It was dark, but I see sh these figures in the alley. They were out back, too, and I, I thought, oh, wow, man, you know. I committed an armed robbery that I jumped bail on three years prior, and they had been searching for me at different addresses, and they caught up to me. So they came in like gangbusters, and uh, they threw me on the floor, and they – you know, they put shackles and handcuffs, and they had the whole, you know, like stuff you see on TV. And I was cursing at these guys. I told them I was going to kill them. I'm going to kill you and everybody you cared about. Not outlaw Josie Wales, right? I wasn't going to do anything. I was a drunk, emaciated coward. I wasn't going to hurt anybody. But I was living this life of uh, I don't know what all my life. So all these words were spewing out of my mouth, and all I did was get shackled and handcuffed. But as I stepped out into the street and walked past my neighbors, it dawned on me that two days before that I was praying to God, and he showed up. He just wasn't dressed how I thought he was going to be dressed. <laughs> right? There was no robe, white beard. There was none of that. He sent the fugitive task force coming for me because that was all that was going to get me out of that house. I never left the house unless it was to go rob or get booze or whatever else I was doing. And that went on. I mean, I didn't leave the house for anything but those purposes for like a year and a half. So God sent what he knew was going to get me out of that house. And at that moment, I woke up to that fact. And I knew I was done. And they took me off to the maximum CFCF uh, detention. And uh, after so many months, I got out. And uh, by a miracle... The complaining witness, the victim, he didn't show up for court. If I was him, I'd have showed up. You better believe I'd have shown up if I were him. But I knew in my heart I was done. Whether I go away for five or whatever it is, ten years, I'm done. And I got out and I started going to meetings. And uh, I prayed every day for God to relieve the obsession from me. But that's as far as I was going to go. I, was, I knew I needed to do something different. I knew using women for sex wasn't going to be on my dance card. I knew uh, illegal activities weren't going to be on my dance card. 
I knew that much. And I knew I needed to ask God to remove the obsession because my experience told me when it came, I go. I'm not doubling up on my meetings. I'm not calling any of you. I'm not doing that. I'm going in, I'm getting loaded. When my mind says go, suddenly shows up, I'm out. So I did pray to God, but that's as far as I went. And then, like I said, I proceeded to make my life manageable with people, things, worship of other things, whatever that may be. It turned out to, for, to, to be a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous because I thought, well, maybe I need to be with somebody that's on this path. Like I was on some kind of path. I was on no kind of path. I didn't know that I was using her to make my life manageable. You know, I'm asleep to that sort of a thing. I was walking around dead asleep dreaming I was awake. You know? And my ego would throw out a couple pearls of wisdom, if I could find any, at a meeting just to keep people off my back. I didn't want anybody asking me how I was doing. I was a lighty anyway, to tell you I was great. So, anyway, my uh, ex-wife's married to the outlaw Josie Wales, and it's not much fun. And she starts going through the work with her sponsor, and she's having a great experience with this. And she made the mistake of suggesting I go through the work as well. And, of course, I, I hated her for that. And uh, she would take me, you know, we would go over to my current home group. It's the underground group. We meet at 4th and Lombard, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday night. Tuesday we do a, a big book study. Thursday is a topic out of the big book and, and a, maybe a speaker. And then Friday night we do an hour speaker deal. And uh, it's a good meeting. And we do our best to bring the message of Alcoholics Anonymous out of the book to that meeting. And I suggest anybody in Philadelphia, Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday, why don't you come down and see us? But she would take me to this meeting, and I'd hear people talking about being a recovered alcoholic and an experience with a higher power called God and going through the steps. And the alcoholic must this and must that and deep and effective spiritual experiences. I wanted no parts of that. My illness would have me squirming in my seat. I had to get out of there. My illness was not about to die without a fight. And she's suggesting I go to this group because she's having a great experience there. I wanted no parts of it. All that did was... All my mind can produce is resentment and fear and misery for me and those around me. And that's what was going on in my marriage, you know, because I was attached to my thinking mind and all the lies it told me. Not just when I was drinking, but sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. I know what it's like to be in these rooms dying of untreated alcoholism with years of not drinking behind me. So uh, she slipped the CD. We were heading up to North Jersey to visit her grandparents. And she slipped the CD into the dashboard, and it was a guy from Brooklyn guy named Peter, and uh, I get a little emotional because I, I woke up to some truth listening to this guy. And right away I knew that, that that was me. He was talking about dying of untreated alcoholism, and I was going to seek this guy out. If I had to put a sack over his head, I was going to go find him, and he was going to be my sponsor. So uh, I f there was a workshop going on at Staten Island, New York, and we went to it because he was going to be there. What happened was my current sponsor and his sponsor were doing the, doing the workshop, and Pete didn't show up till Sunday night. And I built a little rapport with my current sponsor and his lovely wife and his sponsor at dinner and lunch and stuff. And, you know, we're going through this workshop, and I'm waking up to truth after truth. Every step that he spoke on, I was having an experience with the words he was saying. And, but still, when the workshop was over, people were packing their bags and leaving. My illness was still lying to me. Maybe you don't need to get a sponsor. Fear. I had my tail between my legs. Because if you take all my character defects and mix them up in a pot, you'd have a stew called fear. My whole life. So here, I got my tail between my legs. I'm dying of untreated alcoholism, and my illness is still lying to me. And I knew, I knew deep down in my heart that I needed to get a sponsor. So I got down, and the room was almost empty. And I asked God, what do I do? Show me what to do. And when I opened my eyes... It was like something out of Star Trek. All of a sudden, my sponsor was standing there looking at me. And about two and a half seconds before, he wasn't there. And he looked down, and he's a very warm and inviting guy. His spirit's just that way. And he looked down at me, and he says, what's up, brother? He smiled at me. You know, so I, 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 I wanted a sponsor. I didn't know who to ask, so I asked God, and he showed me once again. And uh, I made my approach, you know. And the closer I got to him and the warmer he was, the more my tail got untucked from between my legs. Oops. So I said, Mickey, uh, he knew what I was going to ask him. I said, Mickey, uh, 
you know, I was kind of, you know, uh, and he's just smiling. I says, I, I need a sponsor. I want you to sponsor me. And he says, I'm glad you asked. I was hoping you would. And I was like, whoa, what's that mean? <laughs> he said, tell me how you see yourself. So I did. You know, I'm a delusional guy, so I'm a happy-go-lucky guy, and uh, I care about other people, and, you know, I want to I be helpful to others. And, and he stopped me, and he goes, listen, man. I've been watching you all weekend. You know, there was 200 people in this room, and he was watching me. He says, I've been watching you all weekend, and from where I'm sitting, you look like a clenched fist. I didn't get offended with that, because I had heard that sort of thing. My whole life was a clenched fist. I'd go into a coffee shop in the morning, and whoever was behind the camera would say, man, you look mean. You know, what's wrong? It's not that bad. Smiles, things like that. And I would get offended by that, because, like, hey, I go to AA. You know, I'm a spiritual guy. What do you mean I look mean? But that was the truth, you know. The way I felt inside was written all over my face. My facial expression was screaming my insides. You know, my spirit was not a warm and inviting spirit. You know, it just wasn't that way for me. So after we got that out of the way, he says, you know, he lives in Denver. So he said, look, call me Friday at 5 o'clock and we'll get started. So I did, and I haven't missed a Friday at 5 o'clock in about three years. And the first thing we did was he told me the deal. He says, look, we're going to do Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's all we're going to do. We're not going to do whatever works for Scott Anonymous or whatever works for Mickey Anonymous. And I hear it in meetings, whatever works for you. Don't even tell me that, because whatever works for me may be taking your girlfriend out to dinner tomorrow night. (laughs) That's how it was for me when I first came into these rooms. You know, anything could have worked for me. So we were going to do Alcoholics Anonymous, and we opened up to the doctor's opinion. And then I got to find out what it really meant to be an alcoholic. I got to start experiencing that book, and at that moment, that book became my book. Because I identify with the description of the alcoholic. I used to think, being an alcoholic, and I would raise my hand and say, I'm Scott, I'm an alcoholic. I had no idea what it meant to be an alcoholic. I had no idea just how much trouble I was into when I walked into these rooms. I don't think many of us do. I really don't. We do not realize the gravity of our error when we drink and just how sick we are when we walk in here. We don't. I just don't believe that we do. Otherwise, we'd all be shouting this message from the rooftops. And the fact is, my experience has been the truth is not very popular. You know? This is not a popular message. I don't go with the whole attraction rather than promotion when it comes to the solution in alcoholism because it tells me in there is a solution. It says there is a solution, a solution. And the next line is, I'm not going to like it. Maybe the life and the freedom that I'm experiencing as a result of these steps, that can be very attractive, sure. I'm attracted to those that are awake. But the, the, the uh, avenue that I had to take to get there was not, and even today, is not attractive at times. You know, Continuing to wake up to new truth. Letting go of my old ideas. The dismantling of ego. It didn't come easy for me. And, I mean, I'm always waking up to new truth. My book says I... Deep and effective spiritual experiences. You know? Nothing less than that great fact to get well. And, you know, effective. Let's look at the words. Effective means that they work. Why do my spiritual experiences need to be so deep? You know, my sponsor said it, and it's kind of funny. He says, beauty is skin deep, but ugly is to the bone, brother. You know? And and we got to keep picking that scab open and going in deeper. There's another layer to that onion. You know, my onion's about the size of planet Earth. So there's a never-ending supply of layers for me to to get under and get down in there with my inventory, with my 10th step. You know, and I work, I live with the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12. But I also go through the steps every year with my sponsor, you know. I did a house cleaning, but sometimes you've got to pull out the fridge. You've got to get those dust bunnies out there from behind the fridge, you know. Pull out the couch, you've got to get behind the couch. So that's the work I do with my sponsor. But it wasn't until I went through the first step experience with my sponsor that I really got to see what an alcoholic was, you know, obsession, compulsion, phenomenon of craving, that qualifies me for Alcoholics Anonymous. Crashing cars didn't qualify me for Alcoholics Anonymous. Armed robberies 
didn't qualify me for Alcoholics Anonymous. They qualified me for a state penitentiary. That's it, you know, because even non-alcoholics make poor choices, you know. Do I suffer from the strange mental blank spot or an obsession that maybe it'll be different this time? And once I put alcohol into my body, do I experience a phenomenon of craving? Based on my experience, it wasn't going to be his. And based on my experience, yes. So I was painted into a corner with that truth. I found out that truth without love is just cruel. And God is truth. But God is also love. So the truth about my first step experience came with the love in step two. Before we got to step two, we looked at page 52 with the bedevilments because about my manageability, I didn't see that dash as separating step one into two parts. And that the, the spear of, this, of the second half of the first step is not attached to my conditions of my life as far as possessions and people. It's an internal unmanageability that I suffer from. Because I had everything that my mind would told me that would make my life manageable. I had more money in the bank than I ever had. I have a, a great job, a beautiful wife, beautiful house. She has got a great, you know, everything was great on paper. Car, truck, dog, all of it. And I wanted to kill her, literally. I told myself, if we have one more blow up, I'm going to choke her out. And I'm going to take her downstairs. I'm going to chop her up. And then I'm going to have to look for a way to get her out of the house. These are the kinds of things that were going on in my mind. Four and a half, four and a half years sober. You know? It sounds funny, but she wasn't laughing when I told her that. <laughs> we're best friends now, by the way. <laughs> I felt safe to tell her that. And uh, so I look at my, my seconds. The bedevilments, I had them all. You know? I was prey to misery and depression because people didn't do, act, and say Everything I wanted, whether it was my employer, an employee, my wife, my brother, you name it. I hated the world and everybody in it, including the people in the rooms that talked about being recovered. Because you know what? Maybe for you, but not for me. And that went for my ideas about God. And I had to start off with a maybe with God. But I got to see in we agnostics that I can start with maybe. And it's going to a definitely for me with God. But it started out with maybe, you know. Maybe you people can have a spiritual awakening. I don't know if that's available for me. Because let's look at the record. Look at the hand that God dealt me. I showed up with a lot of contempt for God, and I didn't want to admit that, you know. I didn't want to admit a thing like that. But I did. I showed up to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous with contempt for what was hanging on the wall. Prior to investigation, I had an opinion about what it would be like to go through these steps. I didn't have any experience with it. But like I said, my experience has changed my opinions. And I'm here tonight to share my experience. So, I went with that, maybe. And later on, going through the steps again, my idea about God has really grown, you know. Because if my God's too small, I think I'm in trouble. My sponsor told me God needs to be personal and powerful. Because the alcoholism is deadly and it's going to kill me and it's coming to get me. On a daily basis, I was experiencing it. So I took a look at my third step, you know. And I went to a lot of meetings with lengthy discussions about this third step decision and what it means and all that. Maybe i got to get a yoga mat to do this. And um, It tells me very simply, next, I decided. You know, in, in step two, it tells me God does not make too hard terms for those who seek. And I can look at my third step decision as the terms, you know, that... God's going to be the director. He's going to tell me what to do. He's the principal and I'm the agent that I go out there and I represent God in my everyday life, not just in these rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. How's that look? I can go back to that and ask myself, how's that look? I walk with a lot of considerations today because I need to. I learned that the unexamined life is not worth living because if an alcoholic's not examining his or her life, my experience is we go right back to sleep. So I could take a look at that third step decision. Am I still willing to have my life and will, meaning my thoughts and my actions, turning it over to this power called God? Or am I asking for God to do my will? I've experienced that. Write inventory on some. I find out it's not God's will. I'm looking for I want him to do mine. You know? Woke up to another new truth. 
But having a new employer, it tells me that all sorts of wonderful things are going to happen if I stay close and perform his work well. You know? And at the first go around, it meant doing four through nine. It was just that simple. I've gotten a very different perspective on my role in God's world by going through the steps over and over again. So now we get to my, uh, my four column inventory. Because after my third step prayer, it says next, which means right now I launch into a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a house cleaning. This course of vigorous action is to last the rest of my life. And it's easy to, 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 uh, to slip away from that and get caught up in the thoughts that maybe uh, the vigorous action is just in my fourth step. But I start to write down, you know, these people that, uh, that I'm resentful against, people, principles, things like that. And uh, my ego tells me I'm really not resentful. So I had about eight names so my sponsor says, well, start writing down people you're annoyed at. And I filled a few pages, you know. I didn't even want to admit that my wife annoyed me, right? I was afraid she might find my inventory or that my sponsor would think maybe I was a real bad alcoholic, you know. But uh, I got to see my, my happiness was attached to people and things. How you acted was going to determine how I felt. No wonder I hated the world and everybody in it. It was a recipe for fear and resentment. And I got to see through my inventory that if you played it backwards, it started with fear. And that drove me into dishonesty, self-seeking, selfishness. Because I was afraid I wasn't going to get or lose what I had. I got to see all these things through my inventory. And I got to see how I used people for sex or, you know, to feel good with sex. That all my relationships weren't about love and caring and, and sharing intimacy with somebody. It was about me getting what I lacked from you, emotional security. I need you in my life to feel good. So I got to share this with another man, and that was a little weird for me, you know, talking about my sex life with another man. Not something you did where I grew up and, and came up. And step six and seven, you know, I went home for the hour, but there's not much written in the book. But that doesn't mean six and seven are no big deal. From what I learned is that they are the first step for life. This is it. Do I actually believe God's going to take these things? It's compared to a child with a toy that's broken. The kid's crying. Comes to the father with this broken toy. But when the father goes to remove the toy from the child's hand, the kid won't let it go. It's broken. It doesn't work. But I'm attached to it. It was time to let go, to let go of old ideas, to stop doing business by way of character defect. And do I really believe that God's going to take this stuff? You know, that, that's what six and seven meant to be, it meant to be for me. You know, this is my first step for life. This is going to allow me to live because life was impossible. And I write this harms list. And I was willing because my ass was on the line. There's nothing admirable about me. My life is on the line with this whole deal. This is life and death errand from start to finish for me. Currently, today, I'm on a life and death errand. And I had some very difficult amends to make. One was to a man that I robbed. Besides the emotional amends of family and stuff, for some reason, they seemed to be easier for me. Everybody was so happy I was getting well, you know. But this one particular amends, you know, there were some pretty grave consequences from this. And, uh, but once again, my sponsor told me that them or others doesn't include me. But I had a wife at the time, so I went to her and I asked for her consent. And being, you know, I'm an active recovered member, she asked me what my prayer and meditation told me. And I said, how free do you want to guess the answer I got? So she said, go ahead. So I entered this man's, it was a jewelry shop in Maniok. Anybody familiar with Maniok? I walk in and there's two, I was, dying, I was really nervous. I walk in and there's two customers at the counter and the guy says to me, can I help you? And uh, right away my mind says, he doesn't remember you, leave. But I didn't, I stayed and that was God because my mind said leave. So God allowed me to stay. And I responded, I said, I, I, I hope you can help me, um, but it's very private, I'd like to wait. So the two customers leave and he says to me again, hey, because I ordered it. 
He says to me, uh, can I help you? Right away, my mind said, again, just mail him the money and leave. But I didn't. I stayed. I made my approach, and I told him, I said, about eight years ago, you know, I, I was in really bad shape. I came in here, and I robbed you. And I robbed you of dignity. I robbed you of respect. And I robbed you of your money. And you didn't deserve to be treated that way. And I don't treat people like that today. And if there's anything I left out, if there's anything you need to tell me, I'd like to hear it. And he did. He put his hand on mine. And he said, how long ago? And I said, about eight and a half years ago. And he said, I remember that. Then he went on to tell me that when I robbed him that day, afterwards, he told himself that I was there to repay him for a harm he caused someone else in a previous life. That's why I was there to rob him, because he hurt someone in a previous life. That floored me. He was walking around with that for eight and a half years. He didn't harm anybody in a previous life. I was there because of alcoholism. It told me that's what I needed to do to get loaded that day. So not only was I able to get free of that, more importantly to me, he was able to get free of that. Then he asked me if I believed in spirituality. And he floored me again. He asked me if I prayed and meditated. I said, yes, I do. And uh, he said, I have something for you. And he reached under the counter. And at first I thought he was going to pull something and blow me away. But he didn't. He pulled out a meditation CD that he was selling for $25 a piece. And he handed it to me and said, this is my gift to you. And the tears started coming. Like, forget about it. They were just coming. And uh, I was having a spiritual experience standing here with this man that I had robbed eight years before. You know? This is the kind of things that get to happen in Alcoholics Anonymous. People get free of us. And I get to walk hand in hand with God through a situation like that. We sat and talked about meditation practices for another ten minutes maybe. Then I floated back to my truck and I know I looked like a goof because people were looking at me, you know, like, you know, I'm, I don't know what they thought. But there's a lot of sidewalk cafes there, so I'm like floating by, you know. <laughs> and then I went and made, and what it, I went to make financial restitution to him. He says, I can't accept that. And I said, please, I'm on a life and death errand. And he says, well, how much did you take? He didn't even remember. I said, $460, because I remember. And he says, all right, give me $100. So I did. So I had $360 more dollars. And I went and made amends to a bar owner that uh, he rented rooms. I booked out on the room. You know, it was like a $50 room, and it had been a long time, so I figured I'd pay him some juice, too. So I gave him like $100, and it was a bookie in the bar that uh, I borrowed 100 off of him, and I owed him at least 150 in juice. I paid him and, and an employer that I uh, – I said, if you pay me in the morning, I'll, I'll work all day, and I left at lunchtime, maybe, maybe before lunchtime. You know, I owed him a half a day's wages. I went and paid him. And then I went home. And that was my first experience with making amends. You know, and I'm carrying on my amends today. I believe it's very important to be carrying on my amends because step nine and a half is not going to provide me a, a spiritual awakening. You know, I hear people come into meetings and say, I did everything I was supposed to do when I got loaded. I don't buy it. And I'll pull somebody aside after the meeting. And I'll ask him some questions. And it's not because I'm up here. There's no distance between me and the newcomer or me and the sick and suffering alcoholic who's 10 years without a drink dying in AA. There's no distance there because I have alcoholism as well. And I know what it's like to be dying in these rooms suffering in silence. But I'll ask these men, can I have a moment of your time? And I'll ask him some questions about maybe do you have a sponsor? Does your sponsor have a sponsor? Are you, did you, were you carrying on your amends? Were you practicing steps 10, 11, and 12? Because a lot of us will just go right to 12, and that takes place of the rest of our work. And typically the answers are no or I don't know. I don't know if my sponsor has a sponsor, and typically it's no to the rest of them. So please, I don't say this to them because I don't want to make them feel bad, but I, I suggest perhaps good sponsorship. And I say good sponsorship because that's what I mean. Not somebody who's asleep dreaming they're awake, but somebody who's actually doing this deal with their sponsor and who's also continuing to wake up to new truth. Because that's what this deal's about, waking up to new truth. Not just, you know, four through nine, but really four through nine teaches me to mechanics for the rest of my life. The real growth for me came in 10 and 11. It really did, 
you know, and going through the steps again, getting to look at my whole first, second, third step experience all over again. Like the last time I went through the steps, I had to just ask the question to myself, is my God too small? Have my ideas about God grown? And through my experience, I can say they surely have. You know, I've had a lot of spiritual experiences that have led me to a spiritual awakening, but I'm not attached to those experiences in the sense that they're going to prevent me from having new ones. You know, my sponsor made that very clear to me. We're going to go through the work again, but don't be attached to your old experience that it prevents you from having something new. And I get what he, I know what he means by that. Because I've experienced it. And when I go to big book studies or workshops, I can relate to what he or she is saying about their experience with this work because I've experienced it. And if, I never would have believed a guy like me could stand here and actually have some experience to, to share with you. You know? There's just not enough time in the day to share all the wonderful experience I've had in Alcoholics Anonymous and out there in my everyday life. That 20-year-old son that I didn't see for 10 years, he lives with me today. And his mother, who hated me, is really happy about it. I wasn't allowed in their neighborhood, let alone welcome on their block. When I came down the street, she came out of the house with the phone in her hand calling the cops. Now she's very happy that he lives with me. And it's very challenging. Because I have to tell him the truth. And I'm afraid if I do, he won't love me. You know? He's not living up to his end of the bargain at the moment. And, uh, and I had to tell him the truth about some things, and I was afraid. Because I'm hurting him by letting him do what he's doing. And I had to tell him the truth about that, and I was afraid he wouldn't love me if I did. But he still loves me. I want to talk about an experience. It's not a very happy one, but in one way it is. I went to Fellowship of the Spirit Conference to uh, see my sponsor in Denver, up in the Rocky Mountains. And I met a man from California. His name was John. And he'd been sober as long as I was, you know. And uh, he went to that conference to seek. To seek, he sought out my sponsor. And we were sitting down at dinner, and he told me, you know, he says, uh, I asked Mickey to sponsor me, my sponsor. We became brothers in that sense over this course of this weekend because he was seeking God. This man was 52. He had been sober seven or eight years, and he had no relationship with God. And he said my sponsor, Mickey, was his go-to man for God. So he went out to fellowship at a spirit conference, and they started working together. I just went to Los Angeles a few weeks ago to work for a couple of weeks, and I called John because that's where he lives, and I wanted to hook up. And he says, man, I'm heading to Florida for family, and, and we missed each other. You know, and, and I really wish I got to see him because Friday when I called my sponsor, he said that John was on the beach, and uh, they were playing volleyball, and he didn't feel so good, and he went and sat down. And uh, a woman came by, a jogger. She was a doctor. And, uh, and she said, I'm a doctor. And, you know, let's see what's going on here. And uh, the rescue came. And, and as he, when he got on the gurney, he died. He died of a heart attack. But he accomplished what he sought. He developed a relationship with God. And my sponsor and I were very pleased with that so it doesn't matter how far down the ladder you've gone you know whether you're 10 days sober or 10 years sober sitting here dying of untreated alcoholism it's a relationship with God and nothing less than that great fact it's going to allow you to recover I say allow because our egos are going to try to kill us once me dead will settle for me drunk and do anything to get me there so don't let contempt prior to investigation keep you sick and allow you to die. It doesn't have to be that way. Most deadly illnesses, if, if you, know, you walk in the doctor's office, they diagnose you, can't do much for you. Alcoholism is a deadly illness, but if you're alive sitting here tonight, you've caught it in time. I guarantee there's a big room. Somebody sitting here tonight has alcoholism on them. 
That's been my experience. And you can suffer in silence and listen to your thinking mind right up to the point where it tells you to take a drink. Or you can join us on the broad highway. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. That was promised to me. And we agnostics and I've experienced it. And I want to thank Jeff and all of you for allowing me to come here. And I'm even going to thank Lenny for getting the flu. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.